Nehemiah. Back in Nehemiah, let's see how far we get. Remember, Nehemiah is the great cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. The promise we're chasing down is this promise. It's not really a promise as much as it is a prayer from Nehemiah to God. Uh, I'm looking to see this chesed, this, this loyal covenant um, loyal covenant love and commitment that God made to the Jews and to his city, Jerusalem. Nehemiah 1, 1 says, O Lord, or 1, 11, O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants, the Jews, who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man, Artaxerxes. And he says, now I was the cupbearer to the king. In verse 1 of the book of Nehemiah, this is what it says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month Kislev, in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who'd escaped and had survived the captivity. And I asked them about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity, the remnant of the Jews in Jerusalem are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire. Verse 4 says, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and I mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, Nehemiah, a great man of prayer. I was fasting for days. I was mourning for days and praying for days. So Nehemiah knows, we talked about last time, who Artaxerxes was. And Nehemiah knows that the only person that can, uh, that can bring a change in the future of Jerusalem is this man that he just called him. This king, Artaxerxes. I showed you this timeline last time, uh, and I don't want to show you anything. We're not going to go through it and spend time here, but on two things. In 458 B.C., it was this king, Artaxerxes, who issued a decree for Ezra to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild temple worship. Take the animals, take the singers, take the priests, engage again in, Yah, in proper uh, Mosaic law Yahweh worship at your temple in Jerusalem. The same king, Artaxerxes. And then you go down and Artaxerxes began to be pressured uh, by haters of Israel, no doubt led by Satan. And a few years go by and in 446, that blue circle connects to this date. So in 446, Artaxerxes, the same king who sent Ezra back to, to get temple worship on its feet so that the Jews could pray for him, pray to Yahweh for the king. In 446 B.C., we see that Artaxerxes issues a decree for the walls of Jerusalem to be stopped, the rebuilding of the walls to be stopped. So when Nehemiah finds out from his brothers and his brother's friends who have come from Jerusalem, hey, the city's uh, not doing well, the people are under great distress, they're referring to the fact that just a couple of years ago, great Artaxerxes said, stop rebuilding. The temple had already stood in 515 B.C. 75 years earlier, they had finished rebuilding the temple. It wasn't the temple that was in disrepair. It was the city, the buildings, the city structure, the walls, the gates. And so the people knew that they were uh, not safe. You needed a city wall in those times to be safe from your enemies, so the people were in great distress and reproach. The problem is Artaxerxes is the king whom Nehemiah serves. And his brother and the friends are coming back and saying Jerusalem is a mess, and it's because of this man. It's this man who you served the cup to. Let's not forget the picture. It's this regal, royal, majestic king, Artaxerxes, who's causing this pain in Jerusalem. So when uh, Nehemiah hears the news that Jerusalem is in disrepair, and it's because of the king that he serves, it's Artaxerxes who said, stop building. He realizes the problem that he faces. There's not a man on earth who can rebuild the city of Jerusalem besides that man sitting on that throne. 
And that man sitting on that throne two years earlier said, Stop. Stop rebuilding Jerusalem. Stop rebuilding its walls. Stop rebuilding its gates. And here Nehemiah has this predicament on his hands. You've brought me this news. Am I the kind of godly man that's just going to let the news lie and not do anything about it? Or am I the kind of godly man that is going to request from my God to take action and rebuild God's city? Great leader, Nehemiah. Courageous man. One of the great courageous men in the scriptures, Nehemiah, to go to the king and do what he's about to do. There's only one that can change the king's mind, and that is God himself, Yahweh, through circumstance. I'll show you how this great man, Nehemiah, and his relationship with the king is what changed the king's mind. This is a great, obedient Jewish man, this man, Nehemiah. Great man in the scripture. So in verse 5, look at what it says. Nehemiah prays to Yahweh for a solution. It says he had mourned for days. He fasted for days. He prayed before the God of heaven. And this is what he was praying during those days. Lord, what do I do? What is it that you would have me to do in this situation? I know I have influence with the king. It's kind of like Joseph and and Pharaoh back in Joseph's day. This man, Nehemiah, had influence with the king because of his position as cupbearer. He was a very highly respected Jewish man uh, by King Artaxerxes. In verse 5, we get to hear his prayer. He says, I beseech you, O Yahweh, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Look how he's praising God the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant. Remember our promises. Remember the promises you made to the Jews, to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob about the land, about all these things. Remember uh, the promises to David that he would have an eternal uh, king on the throne. His throne would be eternal. Uh, Remember the promises of Zion, the great Jerusalem, the city. And he's reminding God of these things. Not that God forgot him, but here's a, guy, a man praying to God, worshiping God, lifting God up, revering God, and telling God, we're counting on your promises to hold true. And that's exactly why, what we're looking at this for, because that's exactly the whole point of our study, to see God make promises and to watch Him fulfill them. And Nehemiah here tells God, remember who preserves the covenant and loving kindness. That's a covenant word. Hesed is that word. Loyal covenant love. Remember you made a covenant with us, a contract with the Jews. I'm asking you to remember it now. And send someone, me if that's what you choose, to rebuild the walls of your city, Jerusalem, to protect not only the Jews, but the temple service there, the temple worship. So he calls God Yahweh, Covenant relationship with Israel. This is the name Yahweh that God gave Moses. When they ask you who sent you, you tell them Yahweh sent you. You tell them I am sent you. So that's the name that Nehemiah uses, the covenant name, the contract making name of God. He calls him Yahweh very directly. And then he says God of heaven, speaking of his sovereignty, the fact that this God rules over all things, including King Artaxerxes, he lifts the power, the sovereignty of God up. He calls him great and awesome in his next phrase, which is going to highlight God's all-powerfulness and his majesty. Did you get it? Good job. His uh, power and his majesty. So he is, I don't want to, he is improper. All I'll say is he is properly recognizing his God and God responds to it. They have a wonderful relationship. This is a beautiful prayer. In verse 6, he says, Let your ear now be attentive. He's praying to God. Let your ear, Yahweh, covenant-making God with Israel, let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I'm praying before you now. Day and night. This is a constant pray without ceasing moment for this man. On behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, 
Look what else he's doing. Not only does he lift up God, not only does he hallow God's name, but he also confesses his sins. Very interesting. We have that model prayer from Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 where the very first thing Jesus does is hallow God's name. He lifts God up as sovereign, powerful, majestic, perfect, righteous. Hallowed be thy name. And then he says after that, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This hallowing of God's name, coming to, them, coming to him in confession was a very Jewish way of praying. And that's exactly what you see Nehemiah do here. Hallows the name of God first, and then he confesses the sins of the sons of Israel which we have sinned against you. He's doing it all right. I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah knows why, why Israel was in Babylon for 70 years. He knows the disobedience to the Mosaic law. Uh, and obviously he knows God knows it, so he confesses the sin of Israel. The ongoing sins of disobedience to God. National sins before Yahweh. In verse 7, he says, We, talking about all the Jews, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. It's a beautiful prayer. Daniel chapter 9, there's a similar prayer where Daniel confesses the sin of his nation. And now he carefully brings up here in verse 8 the promises in the Mosaic Law. We have disobeyed, Lord. We've not kept your commandments, your statutes, or your ordinances. And now he brings up the promise of restoring a relationship with Yahweh after disobedience. What a bold man. What a bold man. Bold relationship with this God. Intimate that he could speak to him like this. You've made us promises. We broke the promises. But Lord, don't forget that if we return to you, you will return to us. That's what he's asking for. He says in verse 8 here, concerning rest or being restored after disobedience, remember the word which you commanded. Zakar, remember. Remember, uh, like Zechariah, uh, he says, remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. That has happened, Lord. You sent us out. You sent the north to Assyria. You sent the south to Babylon. We've been out. We're back in the land now. Remember what you said. Look what it says in verse 9. But if you return to me. And Nehemiah is telling God, we are in the process of returning to you. We are returning. We want you to do what you said you would do through Moses. And this is what he says, God, you made a promise to us that if you return to me, if the Jews return to you and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote, remote part of the heavens, from no matter where you've scattered us to, you promised us that you would bring us back into the land. He says, no matter where they've been scattered, I will gather them from there and will bring them, here's the city, and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. What a masterful prayer from Nehemiah. Wonderful understanding of the promises of God, the Mosaic law, and what does he bring up now but the city of Jerusalem? What's the name of the place on earth where God chose to dwell? What's the name of that city? It's Jerusalem. And so in all of this hallowing God's name, confessing national, uh, national sins, then he turns to the Mosaic law. And you said, if we disobey, you'll scatter us. That has occurred. But you also said, when we turn to you again, you'll bring us back. We're counting on that coming back. And we're counting on the city of Jerusalem to re be, be rebuilt because you would bring them to the place. Look what it says. You'll bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, above the mercy seat, 
that sits atop the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God will dwell. And that temple is in the city of Jerusalem. Masterful. Verse 10 says, They are your servants. We've returned. We're coming back to you. He's praying for the restoration of the city of Jerusalem. They are your servants, the Jews and your people, whom you redeemed by your, listen more, hallowing of God, whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. In verse 11, he says, Here's our promise, O Lord, I beseech you. May your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere in your name. We are worshiping you again, no longer in disobedience. He says, and make your servant successful today, praying about himself in the third person. Please let what I have to do today be successful. Grant him compassion before this man. King Artaxerxes, the king on the throne... As far as Nehemiah was concerned, the most powerful man on earth, he is the king of the empire. And Nehemiah is preaching or or asking God to give him success before this man, King Artaxerxes. And then he says, now I was the cupbearer to the king. And he speaks of that position of cupbearer, the the intimacy with the king that the cupbearer had. Saw him every day. Very few people saw the king every day. Nehemiah saw the king every day. So remember the cupbearer is the person that the king would have to trust to serve him alcohol or wine. I didn't mean alcohol, wine, whatever fluids the king desired and asked for. Nehemiah was the one who was trusted to do this to give him something that wasn't poisonous. Nehemiah was the last guardian of the life of the king. And so this Nehemiah had great, uh, a great character before Artaxerxes. He trusted him with his life. Don't miss that point. The king trusted Artaxerxes with his life. And so here we have a man. I mean, the king trusted Nehemiah with his life. Excuse me. So the cupbearer had to be a wise man had to be a man of high character, a man of high integrity, had to be a trustworthy man, had to be discreet, had to be honest. This was a a wonderful servant to the king, and Nehemiah was who it was in this empire, a Jewish man. So Nehemiah asked Yahweh in this prayer to grant him compassion before this man, because remember it's Artaxerxes, who had two years earlier stopped the rebuilding of the city. And all of a sudden, Nehemiah is is asking God, send me in there. I go every day. I have influence with this man, Lord, and if it be your will, give uh, give me success before this man. I would have loved to have been there for those days that Nehemiah prayed to the Lord and heard what else he prayed to the Lord. So Nehemiah knows that if Artaxerxes doesn't change his decree that the city of Jerusalem, where God chose to cause his name to dwell, would never be rebuilt again. But he knows that Yahweh can change this. And so in Nehemiah chapter 2, let's go right into it for a minute. Look what it says. It came about in the month Nisan. Four months have passed. It says that Nehemiah prayed this day and night, fasting, mourning, Uh, praying before the God of heaven. And now we know that it's a four-month period that goes by. Constant prayer before the Lord. Open up a window, Father, if it be your will, let me go into the king. Make that circumstance come about. Bring the right time. And it was four months later that the Lord answered his prayer. It came about in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. We're still in the same year, 444 B.C., that wine was before him, the king, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had, been, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king noticed Nehemiah's sadness after four months of prayer to Yahweh. Still nothing had occurred. All Nehemiah knows is the city is in disrepair. The Jews are unsafe. And so Nehemiah is uh, noticeably sad, and the king said to him, 
Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? What's the meaning of this face? Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. So the king recognizes there's nothing wrong with you physically. You have a broken heart. You've come to me saddened with a broken heart. And Nehemiah, at the words of the king, it says, was very much afraid. What was he afraid of? I'll offer a couple of suggestions. One, he was afraid that the king might sense a dissatisfaction in Nehemiah with the way the king was running the empire. I'm tired of serving you. I don't like the way you're doing things, and my face shows it. And for that, the, remember Pharaoh threw his cupbearer and his uh, baker into prison in Joseph's day. He could have been thrown in prison by this king, or he could have been killed by this king. If the king would have interpreted his sad, long face as a dissatisfaction of the king's job, that would have been it for Nehemiah. That would have caused him fear. But I think the real thing he's afraid of is, for all these days I've been praying for these four months, all of a sudden I have to mention the name Jerusalem to a king that two years before said this Jerusalem is a rebellious and evil city. And all of a sudden, my prayers, he's been praying for this moment, for this event, and all of a sudden, it is go time, and he's fearful. He's fearful before the king because the king knows you have a broken heart, and there's a reason for it. And Nehemiah answers the king. He said, I said to the king, let the king live forever. That's a good start, isn't it? Why should my face not be sad? Listen for the word Jerusalem. Listen for the word Jerusalem. You won't see it here. He's very crafty with the way he, yeah, he makes this argument, this explanation to the king. He says, let, not, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? So notice he doesn't mention the name Jerusalem just yet. It's a controversial name. It's still a hotbed topic, anything about Israel, certainly about Jerusalem. It's an emotional trigger word. And he's careful not to use the word Jerusalem. He simply says, the place where my father's tombs are. That city lies in disrepair. It's decimated. Uh, the gates aren't up. It's an unsafe city right now. He brings up these ancestral tombs, the father's tombs, the place of my father's tombs, because they were a universally respected place during this time in the, in the ancient Near East. Uh, think of things like uh, uh, Pharaoh in Egypt. Look at the tombs they built for the pharaohs in Egypt. The, the burial sites of these ancient people, especially the kings and those in power, were highly, highly regarded uh, what, are the, what are the places where they buried the, the great pharaohs? What are they called? The pyramids. I mean, look at the tomb that they built for some of their, uh, some of their leaders, some of their pharaohs. Highly respected places. So Nehemiah brings up the fact that the places where my fathers are buried is in disrepair, and that would have triggered this king. Verse 4, listen. The king says, Nehemiah has had the courage to speak to the king. He hasn't had the courage to speak the name Jerusalem yet. But the king answers this great man, Nehemiah, this highly trusted man of high character, high integrity, wonderful, loyal service to the king, this obedient Jewish man. The king says, what would you request? Tell me what you'd like me to do. I'll do it for you. It's a personal thing. It's a personal thing. You'd never get me to believe that it's not. This is a personal event between King Artaxerxes and this man, Nehemiah, who is so highly built up to the king that if your father's tombs are in disrepair, I'll let you go rebuild them. 
That's what I think about you, Nehemiah. I think that's what goes on here. It's not a pro-Jewish thing. It's not a love of Israel thing. He says, Nehemiah, go back. Whatever you request, I'll give you. And what do we see out of the greatness of Nehemiah, this wonderful godly man? What's the very first thing he did before he starts spouting words out? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Been praying for four months straight when he heard from his brother Hanani that the city was in disrepair. He's been praying for months about this. And he surely wasn't going to go in. Now that he, his prayer had been answered, he's before the king, there was no way he was going to start this conversation without further prayer to the Lord. Lord, you've got to guide me. I don't know what he prayed for, but I imagine he was praying for guidance, for the proper words, for strength, for courage, and all of these things that we would pray for there, for calm, for focus, but certainly, as I said, for the proper words to say. <clears throat> Remember when Jesus was on the earth concerning speaking to kings and using proper words, this is what Jesus had to say in Matthew 10, verse 18 to 20. Nehemiah is before a king, the most powerful man on the earth at this time, the king of the Persian Empire. And before he utters another word to the king, now that he realizes, my goodness, you have kept your promise. You're going to give me the desire of my heart and the desire of all Jews' hearts. You're going to let me go back to Jerusalem and do what I want to do, rebuild the city walls. And I need to know how to speak to this king. The king just said, what do you want me to do? It's like a free open checkbook. Write the check, Nehemiah. Whatever you say, I'm going to do. The same kind of love and respect that Pharaoh had for Joseph is what we're seeing here. A wonderful, powerful man of testimony, this man Nehemiah. Jesus said, uh, when you'll even be brought before governors and kings for my sake. The exact place Nehemiah is in now, for the sake of the city in which God chooses to dwell, Jerusalem, Nehemiah has been brought before a king of the earth. And Jesus says, but when they hand you over, don't worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. And Nehemiah, we saw hundreds of years before Jesus spoke these words, asked exactly that, Father, guide me. Show me what to say. Lead me before this king for your name's sake. He says, for it is not you who speak, but it's the spirit of the Father who speaks in you. Uh, so back to Nehemiah chapter five, verse, I mean, chapter two, verse five, look at the continuing story here. I said to the king, after he has spoken with God first, we don't know how long this prayer lasts, but there is a moment of silence where Nehemiah turns to his God first and then given the words to speak, this is what he says. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, and obviously he has, the king has just granted his request, send me to Judah. Still not saying the name of the city, is he? Send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Talk about courage to the same king who two years earlier said, stop rebuilding that city, Nehemiah says, send me back so that I can rebuild that city. Talk about courage. <clears throat> 71 years, listen to the number, 71 years have gone by since the temple was rebuilt. 71 years have passed. The temple has been standing. Zerubbabel's rebuilt temple is standing. 71 years go by and the city is still in turmoil. So he asks the king, let me go rebuild the city of God, Jerusalem. And I think that Nehemiah was so highly respected by King Artaxerxes for the loyal service that this obedient Jew did for that king I think that's the reason that the king doesn't hesitate, doesn't hesitate to answer him. What is your request, Nehemiah? Exactly what the king or, or what the uh, Ahasuerus said to uh, uh, Esther when she came in. Ask. 
up to half of the kingdom. Ask whatever you want and up to half of the kingdom, it will be yours. These great people of God in the Old Testament, when they spoke, they could move mountains. We're told that we can do the same. And this man, Nehemiah, by his character, his re reputation in the kingdom of Persia, his relationship with this king, his loyalty to the king, his character is on display here. And this king says, whatever you want, it will be given to you. What do you request? Ask me, I'll do it. So Nehemiah, in verse 6, it says, Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, King and the queen, both in court here. How long will your journey be? That's a yes answer. All I want to know, because I'm the king, how long will you be gone? How long do you need to do this? He says, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. Nehemiah did a calculation. I'm sure for that four months he was trying to figure things out. We'll see a couple of names here in a minute. Nehemiah, I think, did some careful research to find out what it would take to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, how long it would take, what kind of force he needed, what kind of uh, workforce he needed, what kind of timber he needed. A smart man doing some research. He was ready with these answers. When will you return? And he says, so it pleased the king to send me. Two years earlier, it pleased the king to stop the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Two years have gone by, Artaxerxes it being served by this man, Nehemiah, and in that two-year period, however long Nehemiah was his cupbearer, this Jewish man had risen to such a position in Artaxerxes' head, it's okay to rebuild that city. It may be rebellious, it may be evil, but if a man like Nehemiah is in charge of that city, go back and rebuild it. He would make Nehemiah the governor of all of Judah. That's what Artaxerxes would make Nehemiah. It's a character thing. And sometimes you think people aren't watching. It doesn't matter exactly what you do, how you live. Everybody's always watching the Christian today, just like Artaxerxes was watching Nehemiah the Jew in their day. And because of his character, these things occurred for Israel. And now Nehemiah, give me just another minute, Nehemiah gets even bolder. I want to go back and start rebuilding the walls that you stopped two years ago. And now listen to what he says. In verse 7, And I said to the king, If it please the king, I'm remembering Abraham and the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And, and uh, the angel of the Lord tells Abraham, we're going to Sodom and Gomorrah, we're going to destroy the city. And Abraham starts in, well, what if you find 50 righteous men there? Certainly for 50 righteous men, you wouldn't destroy the city. And what does the Lord say? No, I wouldn't. And then I can hear Abraham saying, if it pleased the Lord, let me just ask one more question. What if you find 45? What if you find 40? What if you find 30, 20, 10? What if you find five there? And he continues with this, if it please the Lord, grant me one more request, Lord. That's exactly what Nehemiah is doing. It's already clear that I found your favor. You're willing to issue another decree to rebuild the city walls. I keep walking through this. I'm going to keep going. If it pleases the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. The Jews were not liked people. The city was known as a rebellious and evil city, Jerusalem. So Nehemiah says, I need, I would request from you, king, to give me letters of protection. Once I cross that Euphrates River, start traveling west back to, back, back to uh, Jerusalem, I'm asking you to be protected I want letters of protection. And, as if that's not enough, bold, wonderful leader, this man. In verse 8, he says, And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. See, this is why I think Artaxerxes in these four months has been doing research. Okay, I find out Jerusalem's in disrepair. I would like to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, lead a team of Jews to do this. I think he's been doing research. Otherwise, where does he come up with this name Asaph? He just knows who the keeper of the forest is. 
He knows what, he's, uh, what he can get from him. He says, I also want not only letters of protection, but I want a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me, <laughs> what a bold man, the power of God in this world, able to move mountains. That he might give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple for the wall of the city and for the house to which I shall go. I want you to let me go. I want you to protect me, to promise me, to guarantee me protection. And I want you to pay for the rebuilding of the city by giving me logs out of this, the forest of the Persian Empire. That's what he wants. What does King Artaxerxes say? You got it. What a day. For the wall of the city, for the house to which I will turn. And what does the king do? In answer to the prayer that God will keep Jerusalem, that God will, when obedient Jews turn back to him in worship, that he will gather them no matter how far they've been scattered in the heavens, on the earth he will gather them back to the place where God chose to dwell, the city of Jerusalem. And it says here, And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. It's a character issue. It's a godly character issue. According to Harold Honer of Dallas Seminary, you may know that name, you may not, he's a, a, he, he writes that this event that takes place right here, he dates it March 5th, 444 B.C. He wrote an article in the uh, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary Journal in 1975, the article was called Daniel 70 Weeks in New Testament Chronology, and he dated in that article, this is a, a great historian, writes a, a great treatise on the book of Ephesians. He's a great scholar. He says this event happened on March 5th, 444 B.C. What have I told you that's important about that date? other than the fact that the king is, has agreed to send Nehemiah back to rebuild the city walls, what else is important about that date? Look here back to the timeline. Finally, this is the issue, the big star, Artaxerxes, two years later in 444 B.C., two years after stopping the building of the temple, says, let's rebuild these walls. Go, Nehemiah, I'll name you the governor of Judah. Go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Rebuild their gates. I'll give you the timber to do it. I'll protect you while you're there. But what is uh, also important about 444 B.C., I'm going to read you about six verses, and I'm going to close in prayer, and we'll finish this next time. Look what else this triggers. 444 B.C., Artaxerxes makes a decree for the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Listen to these verses. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity. Three things concerning sin. Three things concerning the future. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision, and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Somebody tell me who made that decree and what year they made it. What was the name of the king that made this decree? What year did he make it? 444 B.C. you got to know all the Bible to be able to make sense of any of it. You have to know all of it. You are to know and discern that from, this is the starting point, that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah comes, Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again, the city, with plaza and moat even in times of distress. What happens in Jerusalem is a trigger for Jewish historical events. 
I wonder if what happens in Jerusalem is going to trigger Jesus to come back one day at the second coming. What's the answer to that question? Of course it will. Jerusalem will be surrounded by Gentile nations and Jesus will come back to save his city, Jerusalem. When his feet hit the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, when his feet hit the Mount of Olives, looking over at the temple uh, complex across the Kidron Valley, when his feet touched down and split the Mount of Olives, he has come back for the city that he has chosen to dwell in for all eternity. He's coming back to free Jerusalem and to make sure that it's safe and built properly. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, over and over, from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Artaxerxes, 444 B.C., until Messiah the Prince, he gives dates, seven weeks and 62 weeks. We'll talk about that later, the timing. Look at what it says in the next verse. Then after 62 weeks or 483 years, trust me, I'll prove it to you one day, but not tonight, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. That's 33 AD. That's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. From the issuing of the decree of, Nehemiah, of, of Artaxerxes in 440 C, you count 483 years forward, and Messiah will be crucified. And if you do the math, friend, you think it works? You think God is smart enough to do some simple math? You think he's smart enough, strong enough to decree 483 years that Messiah came, that not only will he come, but he'll die in this very year? Do you think he can do that? Well, of course he can. When you do the math, if you go home to do the math, remember a Jewish year is 360 days, not 365 days. We'll talk about this one day. I'll write it all down for you. So 62 weeks, 483 years will come. The people of the prince who is to come, that prince who is to come, who's that? No, 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 that's not Jesus. Messiah is Jesus. This is Antichrist. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Jerusalem will again be destroyed. And its end will come with the flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And then you hear more of Antichrist here in verse 27. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That's our seven-year tribulation. Seven years. But in the middle of the week he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. On the wing of abominations will come out one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. All about Antichrist. And then we see after the seven years, the return, the second coming of Jesus, to make Jerusalem free again. I hate to stop. It seems like a strange place. I've gone way longer than I wanted to. The pancakes are going to get cold. But I got on a roll. When the pastor gets on a roll, it's hard to get him off. I don't know if we're going to talk about Daniel or if we're going to wait until we get to the book of Daniel and cover this, probably that. Uh, we'll finish the story of Nehemiah. If there's anything to finish, I'll keep looking at it. Uh, and we'll pick up here next time. Let's close in prayer.